All right, here we go. So, my name is Michael Maher, and I teach sociology here, although the vast majority of you probably don't know that, because I have not taught face-to-face -face on the campus since 2008. But I am here today to, along with my colleagues standing in the back, to relaunch the college theme. And I say relaunch because for those of you who are returning from Spoon River College, you may not have even known there was a college theme last year with all the chaos of last year. But we have it, and I hope some of your faculty are already talking about it in their classes. And we are gathering here four times a semester for college theme presentations. So I am a sociologist, as I said, so my take on the theme here is definitely going to be from a sociological point of view. And you can see that the title of my presentation is Pessimism of the Intellect, Optimism of the Will, and you will understand that in the next 20 minutes. First, to further clarify this whole college theme thing, you've seen the college theme posters around, you've seen them in the classroom, you've seen that there is a presentation schedule on the bottom half. Please pay attention to that because Professor Laura Bandy will be presenting on Tuesday, September 14th, and I want you to come back and see her. What you see on the left-hand side is sort of the mission statement of the college theme. And I know there's a lot of words there, but I'm just asking you to just concentrate on the purple words for just a second here. Similarities, uniqueness, understand and appreciate general education, encourage you to see overlap in academic disciplines and appreciate the contributions that various fields make, developing a comprehensive understanding, and carefully considering various arguments and evidence from different areas. You know those moments when you're sitting in class and something happens in class and you think to yourself, we were just talking about that in such and such class, but we just covered that last week in this class. You know those moments? Pay attention to those moments. Because one of the things that the college theme is designed to do is to enhance that experience, to help you notice that more and more. My colleagues and I are not in competition with one another. We, we look to develop that comprehensive understanding that revolves around these. Now, I know that everybody in here has probably said and or thought this at some point in your life. You may have said it last week when the semester started. I just want to get my general education courses out of the way. Please start to rethink that approach and that attitude. What you see underneath there is the general education competencies. They should look familiar to you because they appear on every syllabus at Spoon River College. So if you can't read them from where you are, communication, problem solving, equity, creativity, decision making, collaboration. This is what my colleagues and I aim to do. This is what we're trying to help you develop in the time that you are here at Spoon River College. I know very well that when you came into this college, you thought to yourself, well, I want to learn technical skills. I want to learn these hard skills that are going to help me get this career and help me get this job. The thing is, is that if you do not pay attention to those general education competencies, you're putting yourself in a very bad spot. Because the job market changes very, very quickly. And it's very, very clear that what, what employers are looking for are people who have these skills. They can train you in any particular skill that they need you for. What they need is they need people who know how to communicate. They need people who know how to problem solve. And that is what we are doing with the general education portion of your college education. There's a reason that those degree plans are structured the way they are on sound educational principles to establish a foundation upon which for you to build. So, as I keep saying, I teach sociology. So as a result of that, I teach about a lot of different kinds of social movements. This is my 25th year teaching. So for 24 years, I have been listening to students tell me this over and over again. I have heard every variation, every iteration of this statement under the sun. And I'm just basically here to tell you I've had it. I'm not listening to this anymore. Right? If this is your attitude about these kinds of social movements, that nothing is ever going to change, frankly, I don't think you're paying very close attention. Not very, very paying very close attention to history in particular. So if you see, take a look at these images, you see images here of the suffrage movement, of the labor movement, of the civil rights movement, of the environmental movement, of the LGBTQ movement. 
And I think one of the very problematic things that happens for me in this field is that when we talk about these kinds of movements, there's this tendency to focus on charismatic figures, right? So you learn about Martin Luther King Jr., or you learn about Cesar Chavez, or you know, in, in terms of women's suffrage, you learn about Elizabeth Cady Stanton and the women's suffrage movement. And part of the problem with that is, is that we have trouble identifying with them. Because we have trouble identifying, well, we're not a charismatic figure, right? That we're not going to be that kind of leader. But the thing is, is that if you look at these images and any other images like it, what you see are lots and lots of anonymous faces. Everyday people who were there as part of those movements, pushing for those causes, and pushing for those causes over periods of generations, not giving up, right? If you think about, say, the history of the abolition of slavery in the United States, think about how many hundreds of years that that took to accomplish. If you think about women's suffrage, you're talking almost 80 years of history that it took. You are talking about a movement in which the people who started it were dead by the time women got the right to vote. But they did it, and they did it anyway, despite the fact that it was not realized in their lives. That is the real lesson behind studying these movements. So change is constant. But the other thing that's constant is the fear of change. So I'm going to quote one of my favorite historians here, a guy by the name of Howard Zinn. And Howard Zinn very famously said, you can't be neutral on a moving train. And what he meant by that, he goes on to explain, he says, events are already, in, already moving in certain and often deadly directions. And to be neutral means to accept that. I think you should think long and hard about that point about neutrality, right? Well, yeah, that's happening, but it doesn't affect me. So I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm not going to say anything about it. Your position of neutrality is, in effect, um, you know, an acceptance of that, that you are okay with that. And you really need to think carefully about those positions of neutrality. Our current challenges, your current challenges, are in part the result of decisions made by previous generations. And those decisions created our present. We've got to be able to connect to our history in that particular way. And we have to think carefully and make decisions, being mindful of the impact on generations forward. It's a bit cliche, and I'm going to use this point. Uh, indigenous Native American cultures in North America, very, many, many of them have this idea of seven generations. Meaning that if you're going to make a decision about what you're going to do right now, you better be thinking about the impact of this seven generations forward. And if that is problematic for any one of those generations, you better rethink that decision. It is that psychic connection that I'm trying to talk about here that we need to make in order to see the real value in our general education, the real value in education generally. Which leads me to the pessimism of the intellect. What exactly do I mean by this? The pessimism of the intellect refers to our capacity to accurately identify and understand the social, economic, political, and environmental challenges of our time. Those, again, are the skills you're developing in your general education courses. Those, those skills are going to help you to identify the problem, figure out some of the root causes of it, and then from there figure out what are the solutions to this problem. We develop this capacity through your education by understanding history and science and by developing communication and problem solving skills and using these skills creatively to build a more equitable and just society and by learning how to collaborate and make decisions based on evidence. Now I don't know if you picked up on it there, but in that bullet are all of the gen ed competencies that I referenced on the third slide. They're all there. This is what we're doing here. But you have to beware because this is only one half of the story. Beware and be careful of this. Because as you acquire this knowledge, it is very, very easy to fall in this hole, this sort of pessimism of, of the intellect that can sometimes lead to despair and lead to hopelessness. And you have to fight that. And you have to fight that with the optimism of the will. And this is what the, the, the connection that I'm trying to make to those past social movements and talking about those people who fought for things who never saw them realized in their, in their lifetime. The optimism of the will is this insistence of the possibility and the desirability for social change and believing in human values that serve as our inspiration for achieving justice, equity, and our never-ending struggle to become a more perfect union. Believing in a better future, believing in that possibility 
even if it's not realized in our time. Right? Being on the right side of history. Because let's face it, surrendering to hopelessness and despair, that takes no effort whatsoever. That's easy. Anybody can do that. But living our lives with intention, with the will to believe in a better future that is worth working toward, that requires effort, requires that will to overcome, and it also requires the tools to understand what is happening and why. So your education, your general education in particular, may be the single best opportunity in your life to acquire the necessary tools that lead to a successful career and to be prepared to meet these personal challenges and the social, economic, and environmental challenges we face. You're gaining those tools right now, whether you realize it or not. They're going to become very, very useful to you very soon. We are focused so much right now on conflict, on division. And what gets lost in all of that is, believe it or not, we actually do have a lot in common with one another. We agree on certain things in pretty large numbers, and you may not realize this. So I'm going to give you just a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. Do you realize that two-thirds of Americans think our government should be doing more about climate change? 66% of us? When's the last time 66% of us agreed on anything right now? And that's probably a low figure. 60% of Americans believe that ensuring health care coverage is, a government's, is government's responsibility, and that's the low end. There's other research out there that indicates the number is as high as 70%. 70% of us believe this, think this. 75% of us want a constitutional amendment that makes it clear that corporations are not people and that the rights protected by the Constitution are the rights of natural persons. 75% of us. Finally, 77% of us say there should be limits on the amount of money individuals and groups can spend on political campaigns. That is a pretty strong consensus. A strong consensus that includes those of us who consider ourselves apolitical, who consider ourselves liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat. Those are doable issues. And not just in the long time future, like this is stuff that can be done in your lifetime. But if it's going to get done in your lifetime, you need to acquire those skills of the general education competencies and put them into action, both in your personal life and in your professional life. And then, of course, we need the collective will. And that's, again, where your education comes in, because your education holds the potential to help you understand your collective power. That is why the poster reads, who can, we can. When we get together with stuff, we get things done. You are agents of history. You are not passive observers. You understand what that means? You have the ability to write the history. But in order to, for us to effectively express our agency and change the structure of society, we have to understand it. If we don't understand what we're dealing with, we're not going to be very effective. Right? Our ability to act effectively exercise our agency is going to be completely reduced. This is why we are here. This is why you are here at this college, and the college theme is an additional tool by which to foster these skills of critical thinking, of communication, of problem solving, of creative and collaborative decision making, to create that more equitable society. So education, think of it this way, is a tool of empowerment. Every academic discipline of the liberal arts provides a unique perspective and a skill. Right? That's why I kept talking about the commonality with my colleagues back there, right? I have course objectives within my discipline that are very, very important to me. But the, the general edu education competencies is what binds me to my colleagues and our collective sort of goal of helping to, to achieve these things. So never forget that point. That some of the most significant life-changing inventions, discoveries, innovations, and insights were multi-generational efforts. Keep your eyes fixed on the prize ahead of what it is that we are trying to accomplish and how it is you're going to choose to use your time here now to push in a particular direction. Because, as I say, many of the people who devoted those, their lives to this, they were dead. But thank God they were here. And thank God they didn't give up to despair 
and that they were able to possess the optimism of the will to carry on because, let me tell you, this society, this country would look very, very different if those individuals had not put that effort forward. So to put it maybe another way, and this may not sit well with some of you, and it may be a lot to put on your shoulders, first semester maybe of college, but I think it needs to be said, and I think you need to start thinking about this. You owe them. You owe them. We owe them. And as cliche as it may be, the only way to repay them is to pay it forward. Right? To carry on and to keep pushing. Use your education to understand this. Use your education to push towards justice. Please consider that. You know, I might just end with you know, quoting Martin Luther King Jr. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. very famously said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Maybe we could make that arc a little bit shorter by committing ourselves to educating ourselves and to thinking very carefully about what we're doing here and how it relates to the future, okay? Building a better life for our children. Okay, with that said, got a couple minutes here. Questions, comments, concerns, frustrations, random thoughts, anything? Someone speak. <laughs> Colleagues? Michael, are there any shows or books or texts that you could point us towards that, that you've read recently or that you're watching that you're consuming to speak to some of these issues? I was thinking Brotherhood Falls, which is a sitcom written by Native people, speaks to the seven generations. Exactly what you said. It's a terrific sitcom. But I wonder if you had anything you could point us towards. Um, you know, maybe if you ask me of like a specific movement, I could. I mean, I'm going to default to to where I quoted. I mean, if you want to read a history book about the United States, read Howard Zinn's *People's History of the United States*. It is an amazing history book, and the reason it is so amazing is because it is not written from the perspective of the generals who won, the presidents who won, the presidents who didn't get caught, the industrialists who made all kinds of money. It's not written from that perspective. It's a history book written from the perspective of immigrants, of women, of racial and ethnic minorities, of the poor, of the working poor, of the white poor. All of these voices of marginalized groups that oftentimes are left out of our historical narrative. There are history books out there like that. Find them. Read them. Right? It will help you tremendously to understand our history. And we've got to. If we don't understand our history, we have no capacity to understand our present. Thank you, Laura. Yes? Along that line, in my environmental science class, I show a documentary fairly recent called Born Blood. Pretty good. It's got Leonardo DiCaprio. It doesn't focus so much on what's causing climate change as we know what's causing it. It's what's going to happen and who's being affected now. Not in the future now. It's right. worth a watch. Right. If you're on the fence or you're not understanding things. Right. I suggest that. And that's obviously a very important issue, in part because my generation and my parents' generation and my grandparents' generation have kicked that can down the road for far too long and now it's sitting on your shoulders. Our failures have become your problems, and you can't kick the can down the road. It's happening. It's here. It's now. Right? So all the more reason for you to embrace your general education to understand how we achieve environmental justice. Thank you. Other thoughts, comments, questions, concerns? Okay. Do we have fun? Yeah. yeah, we have fun? Yeah. I'm not on this campus, but please come back and see Laura September 14th and hear what she has to say. All right? Thank you very much for your time.